Hey there, Booktube. Noah. Everyone who reads and must converse as a channel, thanks for coming by. Um, today I'm talking about a very special book. This is J.R. by William Gaddis. An amazing work. I'm going to try to do it justice by uh, a short little my take on it right here. If you're looking for a more extensive, um, more fleshed out kind of exploration, I'll point you to Leaf by Leaf's video on JR that he has done very recently down in the description box. This work just uh, was reissued, a new edition, an oversized trade paperback by the New York Review of Books just earlier uh, this year, perhaps um, October, I think is when it is when it uh dropped and the literature world is all the better for it let me tell you i can't believe how un, you know little known this book is with to to the amount of an awesome uh writing awesome exploration of ideas and it is very unique there is not a book like this there's not a book like this in the liter the literary world. I would love to see somebody try their hand at it nowadays. So I'll try to I'll try to do my best. What is it what is JR about? So it is a satire. It's a satire of the highest order. It is a an exploration of American capitalism and there is a tension throughout the book between capitalism, like money, and art that is laid out very, very quickly and rode through the entire book. This book is the pure definition of being a fly on the wall. If you could be a fly on the wall, you know, that expression. Well, that is what you are as a reader in William Gaddis's J.R. We open up um, in the middle of a conversation between two um, older women and a lawyer. And in that conversation, the first page right off the bat, you have uh, you, you get very quickly acquainted with what you're in for for the entire rest of the book. These two older ladies you know, barely know what it is that the lawyer is trying to talk about. They're not very interested in it, but they're entertaining him. And they're all talking over each other. It's all happening at once. The, the, the old ladies are talking to each other about stuff. The lawyer is interjecting. Uh, the ladies pick up on something that he's saying and they elaborate on that in their own kind of way and the conversation just gets muddied in this kind of whirlpool where it doesn't really go anywhere until Cohen the lawyer leaves and gets frustrated and leaves and then you follow Cohen out and you go into uh, the next the next scene this book is laid out in scenes. This is perhaps the most cinematic book that I've ever read. It really does read as if you're reading a movie. There, it is, it is all being just dropped into scenes and what you're hearing by the dialogue and what's written on the page is the what, whatever you're hearing as it happens. The second scene is a, a scene of the school, this middle school from hell, okay? Imagine the most, <laughs> you, you, you can't imagine it. You have to read it. This middle school, and, we, and we're in like a teacher's meeting where, you know, there's administrators there and the principals there and things like that. And they're talking finance and they're talking about the operations of the school. While they're doing that, a television is going on because they're actually televising all of the classrooms and all of the kids are like sitting around watching 
the school, like watching the the lessons. <laughs> it's all television. It's all being televised. But they messed up, right? It's not closed circuit television. It's actually being broadcast to the population or something. It's it's complete absurdity. Uh, it's hilarious. But you're in that scene and everybody's talking. There, somebody's on the phone. The television is going. And it's all happening at once. And you are just in there. This book reads like, ju you know, you, you get very little, by the way, of who's talking, especially at first. You get some names, and you can try to keep them, you know, kind of in order if you want, but you don't really have to. What it, what it is, is to just drop into the scene and experience it. And then when you're hearing this, there's just, there's just information overload, information, information through dialogue. And none of it really, <clears throat> none of it really like, you know, groundbreaking or anything like this. And you're just able to just be along for the ride. By the time you are, you know, 30 or 40 pages into it, you are off on one of the greatest, uh, satires that you will ever experience in your life. One of the boys in the middle school, his name is JR. JR cannot think about anything but money. He is a product of his environment and that is what all the adults are all about around him. That's what he's being taught in school and he is obsessed with buying, selling, these kind of get rich quick. He's he's in the mail. He's he's obsessed with his mail and he's constantly sending off for things and and getting it in in these little, you know, get rich quick kind of things or getting uh things sent to him, magazines, whatever. Getting whatever he can. He he's indiscriminate about what he gets involved in just as as long as he can get involved in it. It's so funny because they get involved in all this kind of stuff that, you know, a kid would never have any interest in. But he's trying to find a, a, a way to kind of make money. You know what I mean? That's all he's really about. So J.R. Is, is, is my favorite character in the book, for sure. And J.R. is a very needy, uh, kind of neglected 12-year-old uh, boy. And the thing is, is J.R. becomes this kind of financial monster. Uh, what it is, is they, they go on, his, his class goes on a trip to the stock exchange. The teacher, Miss Joubert, is his teacher. Uh, Miss Joubert is the daughter of a broker, you know, at, at the stock exchange. They live in, everything takes place in New York. And they go to a stock exchange and they buy one stock and they're going to watch it. And this is going to be a way that that the teacher, you know, that the classroom can take part in seeing how money works, seeing how America works, what a stock is and all this kind of thing. Well, uh, J.R. grabs the all the literature he can from from the uh, from the stock exchange and reads it and you know, does, doesn't know what a lot of it is for sure, but he's not afraid to ask questions and be this kind of needy <laughs> middle school kid. And he gets it and, and, and he actually takes to heart what is being told to him. So he's an owner, part owner in this company, and he, he has these kind of rights as owner. And he does this kind of thing where he acquires it, claims it and therefore and then he he kind of puts the the managers of this stock on a kind of you know some kind of blast and gets money borrows money against the stock or 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 a settlement that's what happens is they settle with you know the jr <laughs> And he acquires this money. Well, he doesn't get the money. He doesn't want the money necessarily. He, he right then starts acquiring all this crap 
starts acquiring, you know, anything that he can buy for cheap. He buys some bond. He buys, uh, you know, an, an, an interest in mineral rights on some land in Alaska, I believe. And, um, and it just blows up into this crazy, uh, financial empire. He has a, a, a payphone installed at the, at the, at the middle school there. And he actually, what happens is Edward Bast plays this kind of, um, artist and Edward Bast is a music teacher and gets fired very quickly off in the, in the book. But before he gets fired, he's uh, going on this trip and he gets stuck with the kids to bring them back to school. Well, they forgot the tickets. Uh, Miss Joubert still had the tickets. So there was no return tickets. So Mr. Bass is getting screwed, right? Uh, he doesn't have any money and he doesn't have any tickets to get the kids on. How is it going to happen? So he actually borrows money from Jr. And, you know, the kind of person that Jr. is becoming, you don't want to owe that person money because um, it's constantly, he's on the hook and constantly getting, uh, JR is getting Bass to do things for him, like take his portfolio of horrible trash, uh, stocks and bonds, you know, interest in this or that, taking it to an, a, a lawyer and talking and, and, but Bast is doing this stuff and it just spirals and spirals and spirals. There's so many characters. It's wonderful. Uh, there's a lot of like extras. Like I say, this is a very cinematic and a very auditory book and you don't need to know all the characters because a lot of them are kind of extras and they're for the scenes that they are in. But everything goes uh, more and more crazy all the way up into the end. It is the most wildest novel that is, you know, that I've ever read. That is not, you know, a fantasy, a sci-fi, something meant to be crazy. It is the, it is a, a wonderful uh, example of uh, social commentary, <laughs> commentary on American finance for sure, and the tension between art and finance. That's what I really want to uh, pull out. That that's what it is. And I'm reminded of Blake, William Blake, when he said. Um, He's using, you know, of course, he was a very mystic Christian, William Blake was, you know, not at all the kind of Christian that, um, you know, you're going to find sitting in the churches in, <laughs> in modern day uh, life or something, but a very personal mystical Christian. He said, Christianity is art and not money. Money is its curse. And that kind of thing was just kind of ringing in my head when I'm <laughs> ringing. Re uh, reading this because you know Mr. Bast doesn't have any money and they've been building they've actually built this huge family of companies called the JR Corporation and Bast is completely broke and becoming destitute and can't do what he wants to do and is constantly on the hook doing more and more stuff for JR the conversations that happened between Bast and J.R. are some of the best dialogue in the history of writing. And it's very naturalistic dialogue. I hope I'm getting it across with the kind of thing that I'm saying, because this is a wonderful example of, of naturalistic dialogue. I'm reminded of a, um, a, a movie maker named Noah Bumbach, who actually does movies where the dialogue being of natural quality, the way that people really talk, is one of his strongest points of movie making. And this book does that in, it, on, on a higher level than anything that I've ever come in contact with. Uh, different, for example, like Quentin Tarantino, who has this kind of dialogue that nobody talks like that. But it's like an ideal uh, dialogue. It's like idealist uh, speaking. 
if any if they, if everybody spoke perfectly, you know, and kind of was always able to finish their sentences, was always able to communicate very uh, well and very strongly what they were saying with as few words as possible. That kind of stuff. That's not what you get in JR. <laughs> it is a very, very, very funny. Um, hilarious, actually. I was laughing over and over and over. It was one of the most enjoyable reading experiences of my life. And I can't wait to get into the recognitions because that is uh, William Gaddis's first book. And the just the amazing amount of skill that's in this and took it took to write this book uh i have a feeling gaddis is going to be um just moving up my list as far as most you know most loved authors it was a it was a wonderful experience i totally uh suggest it if you like any of the things that i said about it um one of the funniest char characters to me i love her is Rhoda. So they end up, all the artists end up in this just hellish apartment that they're renting, you know, uh, probably maybe in like Manhattan. Bast is there. Mr. Gibbs is there. He's a, he's a major, major character. He's trying to write a novel and he's a former teacher at the school as well. And they they hang out there. Shram is another artist that used to hang out there, and he uh, he's not he's not in the book in a in a large degree. But this 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 uh, th this apartment is being used by Jr. to ship all of his crap and then to ship it out, and as just like a hub for the for the companies to do work. <clears throat> that he that he's that he's running from the from the phone booth it is uh and and it's just falling apart and there's stuff everywhere and there's a radio that nobody can find and there's water running because the because the handles keep breaking off of the faucets in the kitchen sink and in the bathtub it's just ridiculous but there shows up shram's um girlfriend ex-girlfriend her name's rhoda and she's this kind of <laughs> this kind of punk chick, you know, that doesn't care about much, just, you know, getting stoned and hanging out. She hangs out with a bunch of artists. That's why she's, you know, in this kind of place. And she's just hanging out in the <laughs> in the apartment and she's answering the phones. That's the thing is anybody that's there, you know, they're answering the phones and the phones are being used. That phone is being used by Jr as a as a hub for his company so all these people gibbs <laughs> rhoda are answering the phones and rhoda is so funny you know the bank calls talking about a loan that uh you know or no talking about you know they've lost money on the stocks and whatever so now they're looking to get money right they're asking to get money they're asking for jr or they're asking for mr bass and rhoda just says straight up Look, man, if you want some money, you just go back there to your vault, man. You got all the money. You're the banks. That's what you do. You got the money. You got all the money. <laughs> you're the you're the place for it. And then the newspaper calls. You know, the newspaper calls to ask questions about some, ex you know, exploding uh, up in Alaska to release this natural gas that JR JR family companies is an is has an interest in it. So they're they're calling to do like an interview, some environmentalist, you know, calling to do that. And Rhoda's like, dude, if you want some information, why don't you read your newspaper? You're the news. You got all the information. That's what you do. And is constantly just flipping this kind of stuff around on the people that she's talking to. It's hilarious how she deals with Bast is is so funny and how she deals with gibbs is so funny jack gibbs um jack gibbs might be our most human uh character i mean they're all very human but jack gibbs is is a is an artist that has fallen very very low um and 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 has a bit of a redemptive arc by um, meeting up and having a, 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 a fling 
a kind of relationship fling with uh, Amy Joubert. And it's a, it's a beautiful thing. There's a lot of beauty, <laughs> heartbreaking beauty to this uh, plot and this story. But ultimately, it's the greatest satire ever. I'm reminded of something like Dr. Strangelove by, um, you know, the boy wonder Stanley Kubrick. Because it's told so seriously, like the movie, you know, Dr. Strangelove is told so seriously that it's comic, right? And that's how this is. Everybody is so serious because the subject matter is so serious. And J.R., J.R. is so sincere with how he really is and how what he's saying and uh it, it it's it's awesome but it's so comical because of that because of this sincerity and how serious um it is it is you know delivered so i hope you enjoyed this book too leave me a comment any questions anything there's i could talk about this book for hours it is awesome. Check it out. Let me know if you're going to check it out. Uh, any questions, do it. Um, I might explore it a little bit more if anybody's interested in it. Bye-bye.